I love talking with passionate business owners. Their enthusiasm is irresistible. Their knowledge is invaluable and their wisdom holds the keys to transforming your passion into a successful business. As a marketing strategist, I help people around the world innovate and grow their business. I'm Jay Hamilton Roth, and this is Business with Passion. Today's episode features guests whose startup businesses were launched with well-planned financing. Karen Benke has enjoyed a long and successful entrepreneurial career developing healthy lifestyles businesses. She's now focused on building the world's leading organic beauty company. One of the things that, that probably drove me to just my love for fitness and wellness and, and kind of being robust is, is I unfortunately had a form of leukemia when I was little. So um, I you know, completely came out of that after, I don't know, seven or eight and have been obviously very healthy since then. But I knew what it was like to, to be on the other side of, of health and knew I didn't ever want to go there again. I moved out here from a very small town in Michigan and I was a nurse and going into healthcare was really more about sickness and I was really more interested in wellness and fitness. So I quickly decided that I wanted to start an exercise company and my roommate at the time was a professional dancer and so we teamed up and we started an aerobics exercise company called Get Fit Aerobics and we ended up pitching the Army. So we ended up getting the Army contract for Northern California. So they had been doing calisthenics and weren't very fit and we went in and decided that we would, or you know, pitched them on and ended up getting the contract for heavy duty aerobic exercise and, and you know, lowered their resting pulse rates and increased their flexibility and um, it was the nurses, the Army nurses and the Defense Language Institute and the scientists and all the people that were in the Bay Area in the uh, early 80s. So I'd been focused on fitness, but I really wanted to focus on nutrition, fitness, preventive health, you know, all of those things. So it was about 1983 and I decided to start one of the first corporate wellness companies. Now, anyone watching might say, oh, corporate wellness, right, those programs that go on at the corporate work site. Well, let me tell you, in 1983, no one knew what it was. And there were just a few of us starting these concepts, mostly in the Bay Area, of course, um, in, and you know, taking them to corporations and trying to pitch them on these programs and trying to get them to pay us to come in. To make a long story short, for 15 years, um, I bit by bit and slowly built one of the first corporate wellness companies in the country and it ended up, um, uh, we ended up providing uh, executive, exam executive wellness exams in the Bay Club and then cor worksite corporate wellness programs all over California from north to south. And it was at one second time when HMOs were kind of all escalating in the early 90s and several of them started bidding on my wellness company. So it was great validation for me that I had actually built something that people wanted and I sold the company to Pacificare, which worked out really, really well. But it fueled my passion in that we, we really um, helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people quit smoking, lose weight, um, lower their cholesterol, get their stress under control. And through all of our programs that we did at corporate work sites throughout California, so it really just, it was, it was my love. And I built it, you know, step by step. And, when I sold it to Pacific Care, it was the right company to sell it to because I stayed there for five years and, and it grew even larger. And uh, then I thought, well, I'll retire. I'd, I had, at the tail end of that, I'd met my husband and you know had my first baby at 40 and my second at 42, so I was going to take it easy for a while. When I became pregnant, I became completely obsessed and possessed with reading ingredients on labels. And here I had been completely focused on nutrition and fitness and you know all most aspects of wellness and moving you know later to organic food not just healthful foods but organic healthful foods but I had never really paid attention to what I was slathering all over my body and face until I became pregnant I started reading labels like mad and then I started researching it because at this point I had you know probably 20 years of building wellness businesses maybe more and I was horrified at what I saw on the labels. I immediately went off and started to look for a company to buy. I thought, well, you know, I've started a couple businesses. I'll buy a small organic beauty company. Couldn't find one. 
So then I started looking at natural beauty companies. I thought, oh, I really want to go to organic. To make a long story short, I actually found the name um, Juice Beauty and I found uh, there were a couple entrepreneurs in Mill Valley actually that um, had come up with a name. I think there were five of them and they had a few products and they were uh, billing a thousand dollars a month and so um, uh, I basically bought the name. I needed to find a world-class formulator so fortunately being in the Bay Area uh, with just ripe with so many wonderful people. Um, I found Melissa Yoakum who had spent the last uh, 15 years, I think about at that point, yes. formulating in the natural and organic world. So the two of us came together and started pretty much from scratch and decided that you know we had a great name but we really wanted to put juice in Juice Beauty. Definitely in juice and when we started playing with that idea of fruit juices as a base, it was a lot of fun. I mean we actually were like we know why we drink fruit juices. All what? the antioxidants and vitamins and minerals, and we thought it could do the same thing for your skin. And we started breaking down each juice as to what the benefits were and came up with blends that are even now patented. Nationally, we grew through really knocking on the door of many retailers. And we have a great um, story in the beginning because we contacted um, David Saltiano, who's the head of Sephora, who's a Marin resident and Sephora US is headquartered in San Francisco and we told him what you know we wanted to do we wanted to really develop a prestige organic beauty line and he was very gracious and guided us through that process of what the packaging should look like and you know so we launched in a few stores with Sephora and then we did well and, and launched uh, in a with wider distribution so Sephora was very helpful in the start of Juice Beauty. And so then we expanded to Sephora Europe and that expansion was about a little over a year ago. And then we started uh, being contacted by distributors all over the world and hired a, an executive, uh, Jeff Holland, who was very um, adept at, or he was very networked in the international distribution world, having been in the beauty business for a long time. So Asia was our initial target and boy Asia loves organic, they love California, they love beauty, they love the story behind our brand, they love the women behind our brand, <laughs> they love everything about us which has been amazing. So we have large counters in Asia, in Thailand, in all the major department stores, Siam, Lane Crawford in Hong Kong, Harvey Nichols in Jakarta. Um, we're, we've opened in Singapore, we're opening in Malaysia, Korea, in all the major department stores in Asia and we're doing extremely well there. When I started my first businesses, of course, in the early 80s, the 17 credit cards and everything, when I uh, started Juice Beauty at that point, I was a little bit uh, more mature and a little bit more experienced and had had some success under my belt with my wellness company and from having been on the board of 24 Hour Fitness. So um, when I decided to move forward with Juice Beauty, I went to um, really my best business acquaintances and people that I had worked with. Um, I had actually set up a couple criteria uh, for the people that I approached to raise money. And first and foremost was um, I put in the most money initially. And so when you approach people and you've put cash up, not just an idea, but you put hard cash on the line, that's impressive to people. Secondly, I approached people that I trusted and that I knew well and that um, the type of money I was raising, which, which wasn't insignificant, but uh, would be more discretionary money for them. So I wouldn't have to stay up at night worried that they weren't going to be able to meet their mortgage payment. So uh, high net worth individuals. And then thirdly, people that were passionate about wellness, organic, and fitness. So people that truly believed that they wanted to make a difference. So I went to people really that I had had business relationships with for a period of time and went to about 15 investors and we raised a significant amount of money in the seven figures. The beauty business, of course, is a multi-billion dollar business with a huge, huge players um, with Estee Lauder and L'Oreal and et cetera. Um, and Sometimes I wake up in the morning and think, what have I lost my mind? I'm starting a brand next to all these 
huge corporations, but it, it has been a lot of fun. Um, we, the organic market isn't tracked very closely. It's usually lumped together with the natural and organic market because there are very few organic products, and which is a whole other issue. Most people don't know the difference. But so if you look at the natural and organic market, it, 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 before the recession hit, it was the fastest growing niche. So all of their beauty was growing at about 5% a year and natural and, natural and organic products were growing at about 25% a year. When the recession hit, the, everything just flattened out and it, a lot of products, you know, the, the um, kind of uh, typical beauty industry or the non-natural and organic beauty industry went into the negative and I think natural and organic mostly went flat. So anyway, and we're, we're just, uh, we're one of the um, leaders in organic beauty, very small, small market, just really a handful of brands still very, very small, and um, we're in the multi-million dollar range, but we really don't divulge our, our top line at this point. <laughs> I get a lot of calls from entrepreneurs, and they always ask me, well, how can I raise money, and you know, I, I just, can you give me advice? And I always tell them, you know, somehow, go to your friends, your family, and your network, people you've worked with, and because they often want to go to strangers, and I always ask them, if you can't trust your instincts and your uh, ability to move forward and you can't face some of your you know, close business uh, associates, then you might not have such a good idea or you might not have enough trust in yourself. So um, I try to encourage people to really go to people that know you and trust you and also, however you do it, put your own money on the line. You know, I've always found as an entrepreneur to not look at the end point because I think you can get distracted. And you know, my um, aerobics business turned out well. I just melt, molded it into my corporate wellness business. My corporate wellness business, I wasn't even thinking about an endpoint when uh, the HMO, you know, Pacific Air and Health Net and Blue Shield and everyone started bidding on my company. So um, with Juice Beauty, really we think about every day how we can gain more market share how um, you know everything from short term our, our short term monthly results to long term how we can gain more market share long term our US distribution plan and our international distribution plan and you know that's that's really all I think about on a day to day basis is kind of balancing the short term monthly results with the long term where are we going to distribute um, how can we grow um, you know, how can we grow our current distribution? Is our current distribution correct? Do we need to modify it a little bit? But it's more about how we can gain market share and, and kind of get over that small business, you know, hump and become a bigger brand. So that's what I, I think about day in and day out. And that's what I wake up at 2 a.m. and I'm either gleeful or I worry, depending on the day. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I meet these entrepreneurs that are, that claim that they're calm and they have no anxiety and I keep wondering what drug they're on because I have never been like that. I've always kind of been half driven by, well, you know, 90% driven by passion, but there's a, there's a chunk in there that's driven by anxiety and, and uh, you know, wanting to beat out the competition and, you know, worrying about that. So, um, that's the future for us is putting one step in front of the other and we truly, truly want to be the leading organic beauty brand in the world. For me, the key strategic insights of Karen Benke's success are, first, her passion for wellness allowed her to identify untapped markets. Next, by developing a strong track record, she was able to attract substantial financial interest. Lastly, She's not afraid to compete with multinational corporations. My next guest, Sharam Bijan, used proceeds of selling his internet company to self-fund a series of restaurants. By focusing on the bottom line and great concepts, he's positioning his restaurants for long-term success. Decided to go to art school at the age of 18 and study advertising and marketing. And during that period, I met a friend of mine uh, named Rohan, who was an um, Indian guy. 
and we were, became good friends and we got to know each other for several months and we always uh, wanted to kind of create an internet company. This was during the boom, this was 1999 and uh, we thought it would be such a great idea to come up with an internet idea. So one day while we were driving to the airport to pick up his dad's business partner um, who was happening to travel to San Francisco one day, uh, we thought of this great idea to swap products. We were into video games, into baseball cards and all kinds of different um, you know, items that kids play with. And we thought it would be a great idea if you could trade goods without having to spend dollars. And you, know, you get points for it and then you can use your points to buy other products. So we talked about it. And his dad business partner came into town that night and we went, took him to dinner and pitched him the idea. And he thought you know, it was really smart, it was really different and there wasn't anything out there like it. So he liked it very much and he said, okay, I'll fly you guys to India and uh, you know, we'll see if we can put the company together and come up with some ideas for it and, and move it forward. And I went to India and we, I went to India for three months, um, put together the business plan, raised funding from him and some uh, other people and came back to the United States and started a company. Um, slowly, uh, we put the company together, hired, hired people, and this is why I really gained a lot of knowledge about business and running a business, essentially. I had to hire people that were a lot more experienced than I was, and um, the biggest challenge for me was to have people that would respect me and uh, you know, take guidance from me in terms of what my vision was for the company. Um, the CEO of the company that we hired was a 38-year-old you know, executive who had sold a multi-million dollar company. Um, so I think the biggest challenge was for me was to um, have him trust in me and my vision um, and what we had for the company. So a year into the company, uh, we got an offer by an Indian company who was also in the same type of business of swapping and uh, trading uh, to buy our technology. Um, it was in a multi-million dollar figure and it was something that seemed uh, like a really good offer after a year of being in business. Uh, so we took the offer and there was three partners in the company, myself, Rohan, and uh, his dad's business partner who was also one of the main partners and uh, it happened to be uh, something that was a very generous offer and we thought it was the perfect opportunity to sell it and we did. After the internet companies um, I always had a passion for food and wine. I thought it would be the coolest thing to have your own restaurants, uh, you know have friends come over, have the cook chef for you, uh, the chef cook for you whenever you wanted and make all kinds of great dishes. Uh, not really understanding the business aspect of it or how much it entails to have a successful business. Uh, but I grew up, my dad cooked, he was a gourmet chef at our house and he cooked for us and had all kinds of exciting meals and um, even you know, growing up I had sips of wine and, and with food and just found it really interesting, the different combination and I think that kind of goes back to my sense of art and creating um, all those different things with food. It's, it, to me, it's just a form of art. You know, it brings different senses and emotions out when you're having a great dish or when you go into a restaurant and it just, it's just a really interesting ambiance. It, it, it captures a lot of different emotions and senses that arise in your body. And for me, I always wanted to create something like that. So I bought my first restaurant, which was First Crush, and I came into the same dilemma that I did with the internet companies. I walked in there as a 23-year-old, and all these servers and chefs are looking at me like, who the hell is this kid? You know, he's coming in here, no experience. I'm sure they were worried about their job because they didn't think the restaurant would succeed. And there had actually been a lot of failures in that restaurant as well. But I kind of looked at it from uh, a customer's perspective. I took it from how I would want to experience a restaurant when I go into it. And I think that um, naiveness and naiv naivety, naiveness was something that really helped me be successful because it allowed me to look at it from a different perspective than as a business, from just from a business standpoint. And I went in there, I sat down, I looked at everything from the music to the lighting to the decor to the dishes that came out and said, you know, what would really excite me to come back, uh, to get me excited to come back here? Um, and I really, um, restarted the restaurant from that element and uh, my dad came in and helped in the kitchen with recreating many dishes. Um, I went and talked to all the hotels which were around the restaurants asking them hey well you know why do you send people to, the, to these restaurants that you do and really trying to learn as much as I could about the business and it took off. Um, after um, being open for four months uh, and I remember it was August uh, of two, 2001 and we had 60 reservations on the books uh, and I called my parents and said oh my god we have 60 reservations and I was so excited and uh, you know if we had 60 reservations now I would probably die but it was just something very exciting for me just seeing the momentum build so after the success of First Crush San Francisco I thought Mill Valley is a perfect they're very affluent there's a lot of money in Mill Valley 
and Fresh Crush is a wine theme restaurant. It's California cuisine with wine theme restaurant, and uh, I thought it was a perfect fit. So an opportunity came up. It was an old Thai restaurant, which was at 24 Sunnyside in Mill Valley. And uh, the lady who was there was looking to get out of it. And it was a beautiful old house. It was built in the 1900s and it had two fireplaces. It had a very interesting charm to it. And as soon as I walked in, I fell in love with it. I uh, decided to buy that restaurant. Uh, it was much uh, less expensive than First Crush, but you know you had to put a lot of money into it to get it started. I put in about $200,000 to remodel it, get it going, hiring the chef. And the chef is probably one of the most expen sp uh, expensive components of the restaurants. Uh, he was getting paid around $65,000 a year, had a manager there, but also our sales were great. We were doing around seven to 8,000 on the weekends. We were doing about five to $6,000 on the weekdays. So it paid for itself and we were profiting probably around you know, 15, 20,000 dollars a month initially. And this lasted for about a year. Um, slowly the numbers started to drop off. By the end of the first year, I would say we were probably profiting around eight to 10,000 dollars a year. Um, then at that point we realized that the numbers were dropping pretty quickly. Um, we just weren't getting the same volume. Uh, on the weekends we were selling three to four thousand, which you know was half of what we were selling before, and we couldn't cover our overhead. Um, then we started to break even about a year and a half, two years into it, and the amount of work and energy that went into it, it just didn't make sense to stay open. Obviously, you know, breaking even. Um, our sales ended up being, I believe, around a million two for the year um, by the end of the second year, and it just wasn't enough to keep the overhead going. One of the things that I learned very quickly is the restaurant might have the right concept and it may be great food, but if it's not in the right location at the right time, it's not going to work. And Mill Valley happened to be that experience. Um, Mill Valley is very much a bedroom community. There's a lot of kids and families, and when they go out, they like to go uh, somewhere where they can take their kids, or if they go out for having fine dining, they go to the city. Um, they don't usually typically stay in Mill Valley. Also, we didn't have a bar scene. We had a great wine program, but we didn't have hard liquor. So another thing that was very successful in Mill Valley was people going to the bars and you know, the divorcees meeting each other and, and uh, people meeting up at the bar. And we didn't have that. So that was also a huge challenge for us. I thought you know, we might, might be smart to make a change and make it more of a family style restaurant. So we decided to create a Mexican themed restaurant named Mikasa which uh, was there for a very short period of time. It was there for six months. And this was during a period I came back to San Francisco to run for Scrush because my manager had left. And I left it in someone else's hands, which was probably another big mistake that I made. Um, if you're not fully engaged in the business uh, right off the bat, um, people can't really take your vision and, and make it come to life. You really have to be involved with it. Um, by the time I got back, I realized that it was too late. Uh, it wasn't the right menu. It wasn't the right uh, you know, feel in the restaurant, just everything about it was wrong. And I decided to pull the plug on that very quickly. So after Mikasa, many people would have thrown in the towel. And for me, it was a challenge to make that space work. Um, I really believed in it. I thought Mill Valley was a great location, had potential. So I decided to give it a third try and do a restaurant called Aura, which was a Pan-Asian restaurant. And this one, from all the experiences I learned, I really put everything into it. For everything from the design to the chef that I hired, I had hired good people before, but I really went all out on this one and tried to make it work. And to this day, I think this was definitely the best restaurant I've done in terms of all the components coming together. Um, we started out, again, it was something which was very, very successful initially. Um, it was Pan-Asian cuisine, so it was very eclectic and different, and people wanted to come try it initially. Uh, we got a few great write-ups. Uh, people really loved the food, and it was very exciting. I saw it really bustling initially, but it kind of fell into the same trap as the other restaurants, where it became more of a fine dining rest destination than a kid's family style restaurant. Uh, once you fall into that trap, then it's a downward spiral because people don't go out there during the week. Weekends were always packed, even to the time that we closed. But during the week, um, it was more challenging to bring families in. Uh, we tried a lot of different promotions, a lot of different tactics to bring people in. And at this restaurant, our overhead was definitely higher because the chef was getting paid $100,000 a year. I had a great manager there that was getting paid very well. Um, and the food cost was definitely higher as well. We used really great ingredients, um, items that you wouldn't find on a lot of menus. Uh, and eventually, same situation as with First Crush, it started to lose money and this one started to lose money much more quickly than the other restaurants. And by the end of it, which was two years again, we were losing about fifteen dollars to $20,000 a month. And at that point, I decided that, uh, you know, it's time to pull the plug on that. I had 
put everything I had into it. Three restaurants was enough and it was time to move forward. During the time when First Crush uh, in Mill Valley was operating, uh, about six months into it, it was still doing very well. And an opportunity came by to have, uh, to, there was a space across the street that used to be called Sunnyside Cafe. It was a restaurant that was there for 12 years and had been very successful. Um, all of a sudden I saw a for lease sign up on the, up on the window. And to me, it was just like common sense. It was, this restaurant's been here forever. It's a staple of Mill Valley. I ate there all the time. And I was actually very surprised that it was up for sale. So I went and met with the landlords and they decided to lease it out to me. And I changed the name to Toast. The Toast concept was to create great comfort food uh, for everyday type of eating where families can go and feel comfortable. It's the same type of food that you grew up with. Uh, the same type of food that you eat at your own house and you don't have to hassle cooking it at home or spending all the money, you know, getting all the ingredients for it. And I think uh, a big lesson of that was going through the three reincarnations of First Crush, Mikasa and Aura was that trying something simple, you know, might just work. Something that people can bring their kids to and families to and have a great chicken pot pie or fried chicken or just simple breakfast. And uh, that's what we kept with to Toast. It's just making really great comfort food that everybody is familiar with and make it really well. And uh, to me, to this day, I think that's a formula that uh, will always be successful. It's something that you can do over and over again and people will fall in love with it if it's a good dish that they're familiar with and they've had when they were growing up as a kid. Five years after I opened Toast in Mill Valley, I got together with a great architect to design the new Toast, which was a much bigger space. It's a 4,000 square foot space, uh, outdoor seating. There are 200 seats in this location, where in the other one it's only 50 seats. Um, it was a big risk and a big gamble, but I definitely thought it was something that had potential and decided to, again, just make the move and try for it. And um, luckily it's been a huge, huge hit. And to this day, it's by far been the most successful restaurant I've done. In 2009, First Crush is, uh, had a little bit of a downturn actually during the economy. It's, it is a fine dining restaurant and, and tourism had definitely slowed down in San Francisco, uh, but we're starting to pick back up. Uh, the numbers have steadied out a little bit. So during the weekdays right now, we're doing between 100 to 150 covers. And on the weekends, we're doing anywhere from 150 to 250 covers. Our sales have probably dropped down, I would say, to around 2.5, 2.6 million a year. Uh, Mill Valley has stayed pretty consistent uh, in 2009, I think, also, again, due to the style of food that we're serving. It's comfort food, and uh, people, even in a downturn economy, go out and eat. And our numbers there are, we do anywhere from 250 to 400 uh, covers a day there, uh, depending on the weekday or weekend and our sales are around 1.6 million there. And Nevada, which has been the gangbuster, uh, you know, we do, like I said, anywhere from 700 to 900 covers uh, a day here consistently, and our sales are anywhere between, we're projecting around four to 4.5 million for the year. I see the key strategic insights of Sharam Bijan's success as, first, by thinking big and having good connections, he was able to find success early. Next, Self-funding his restaurants has provided him the luxury to experiment with the business's marketing and staffing. Lastly, he's not afraid to take chances to pursue his business passion. Today's guests, by launching their businesses with well-planned financing, were able to think bigger, take larger risks, and achieve more business growth. I hope that this episode has given you many good ideas for increasing your business with passion.